Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Social Distancing Social. Thank you so much for joining us for our conversation about imagining worlds and seeing them come true. We're very lucky to be joined today by two of the most popular writers of speculative fiction, Veronica Roth and Peter Warren Singer, who writes as P.W. Singer. Veronica Roth is the author of the Divergent series, which of course, the components of which are Divergent, Insurgent, Allegiant, and The Four, a Divergent collection. The Carve the Mark duology, Carve the Mark and The Fates Divide, The End and Other Beginnings, and most recently, her first book written explicitly for adults, Chosen Ones. Welcome, Veronica. Peter Warren Singer, or P.W. Singer, is a strategist and senior fellow at New America. He is the co-author with August Cole of the newly published novel, Burn In, a novel of the real robotic revolution. Uh, listeners, uh, if you are viewers, excuse me, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A slot at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we will bring them when we can to our esteemed guests. I'm going to begin with a question for both of you. Uh, when you're writing fiction, and especially speculative fiction, there really are no limits other than the limits of your imagination. So I'm curious how you build your fictional worlds. Veronica, when you are in the earliest stages of a piece of fiction, how do you decide what kind of world it's going to be set in? Sorry, just figuring out my mute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hello. Um, oh gosh, it's a good question. I am kind of a concept driven writer, so for me, it's not character that comes first or even plot. It's just like a, a bigger idea, um, which I think is probably why I gravitated towards science fiction and fantasy to begin with. Um, and it really just kind of depends on whatever that big idea is. So for Chosen Ones, um, I wanted to write about what happened 10 years after you saved the world from a dark lord. <laughs> um, so it had to be, you know, in this world that was close to our own. I think that was what made it appealing to me. Um, and then everything sort of spiraled from the magic system that I built as a result of that. So um, yeah, I, this is like a, the least specific <laughs> answer. Um, but I just try to, once you make one decision, then you find yourself making a series of other decisions and suddenly you find yourself in you know whatever world you've built so i just try to take it one step at a time i think do you remember the first thing that came to mind when you when chosen ones started to pop into your head um well i i think i was always curious about the other people in chosen one stories so like the the hero's girlfriend or <laughs> Uh, so that's kind of where my main character Sloane started. She was supposed to be like, this was going to be her story as opposed to his story. And then it changed um, as the concept developed. But um, I, I wonder about that. Like uh, there's a, an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer called, I think, like the Zeppo or something, um, <laughs> where it's like the B story of the episode is the focus. So it's like Xander and his weird hijinks. And then in the background, Buffy and Angel are saving the world. And so I've always loved that kind of like meta narrative stuff um so i think that's kind of what started the, uh, you know where the idea came from i think i'm one of the only people in the world who loves television but isn't a buffy watcher i take it though that zeppo is a reference to zeppo marx i don't know <laughs> yeah I, th I think so he's, he's the forgotten marx brothers uh well the forgotten marx brother uh so that's uh, uh really interesting um peter uh i hope you'll forgive me from reading from promotional materials from your book, uh, Burn In. Um, but if I can quote from the book's Amazon page, quote, an FBI agent hunts a new kind of terrorist through a Washington DC of the future in this groundbreaking book, at once a gripping techno thriller and a fact-based tour of tomorrow. Now, I love the phrase fact-based tour of tomorrow. I know you almost certainly didn't write that description, but it makes me wonder about the balance of fact and fiction in your work. When you are setting out the contours and rules of your fictional world, how conscious are you of sticking to what's possible or plausible? 
So it's actually at the very essence of the whole design of the project itself. Um, so what Burnin is, and it, and it builds on something we did in a prior book called uh, Ghost Fleet, is that it's a combination of novel and nonfiction. So from the very start, we're both world building. And um, just like, you know, Veronica said, there's these kind of moments in, in the fiction creation when you um, begin to, you know, discover your character, uh, when that character looks back at you and you begin to sort of, you know, understand their backstory, uh, you begin to work out the settings and the plots. But simultaneous to that, we're conducting, you know, a classic nonfiction research project. We're doing, um, you know, pulling threat reports from cybersecurity. We're doing interviews of real world people. And then that interviews, you know, just like you in, in fiction, sometimes it's informing you for, um, okay, this can actually happen. Other times there's that little thing that they say that becomes a turn of phrase that you'll use in a character. Or there's a couple of scenes in Burn In, um, big, you know, attacks that bad things that happen. We don't want to plot spoil too much, but basically bad things that happened to Washington, D.C. that was um, essentially from a, a guy working on the water systems of Washington, sharing that um, uh, essentially how to flood the metro system that it really could happen. And so, you know, okay, I'm like, oh, we're going to add that in. <laughs> um, and, and so there are a conscious set of rules that we follow. We call it useful fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, real quickly, the four of the rules are um, one, uh, real world timeline. So uh, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, who was a phenomenal scientist, um, he invents the idea of artificial satellites, but he's even better science fiction writer. He talked about how once you moved uh, more than a generation ahead, you kind of moved from science into the realm of magic. Mm -hmm. And so we start, try and stay within that one generation timeline. So every technology that's in the book is drawn from the real world. Um, the other real is real world setting. So it's all takes place in DC um, and real places to it, but you know, amazing things happen in it, but it grounds it in that way. Um, and then another is the idea of um, real characters acting realistically. So, you know, we're in there, there's bad guys and there's a hero, but the types of things that they do are what a real person would do in that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that to me, you know, I think that combination hopefully makes it both, it hits the education side, but also I think makes it more entertaining because it has that, oh my goodness, this really could happen. Uh, that makes the scenes hit harder. Uh, Veronica, you, I I'm guessing, don't shy away from magic. Um, to what extent do you worry about plausibility and, and what really could happen in the world that we're living in? Or, or do you enjoy straying from that? Um, I, I do, and I'm coming at it from the totally other angle where I think I've become more of a realistic writer over time, but I started out like, ah, <laughs> um, full on like sort of dystopian fantasy. But um, for me, what's important is to have internal consistency. So as long as like, you can't break your own rules because then you destroy the experience of reading for everyone. If there can be an act of God or a sudden revelation that changes everything that you've established up until that point, like the whole system breaks down. So for me, that's important. And then I do think it's, it's a priority to make sure that characters feel like, even though they're dealing with an impossible or strange uh, situation that they're acting like people. Um, so uh, trying to get the the real people acting realistically in the <laughs> totally bizarre, um, you know, can control magic with your mind uh, camp. So um, yeah, that's uh, my my priority is a little little less research, a little less realism, I would say. Yeah. But, um, I do it's, it well. It's research. interesting. I apologize. It's interesting though because I think. I, unfortunately, I'm not able to do magic with my mind, but I dream of it all the time. And so I, I love to put myself in that position. But Peter, your characters, I imagine, um, sometimes do things that real people could do, but they have to be particularly skilled or particularly smart, which actually feels more of a challenge for readers to put themselves in that position. Do you think about that when you're writing? Well, Sitcha, I wanted to pull back one, um, and it connects something that you said before that Veronica brought up, is that... Um, you know, the appeal of something like, uh, of the TV series, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or you think about Game of Thrones, 
is actually how realistic the characters are and everything from their actions to um, the way that they speak. And that's what I think, you know, makes people love them even when they're in settings that are fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, it also frankly makes them useful. I've been part of a couple of projects that um, have brought together everything from uh, US and allied military officers and they've used, in one case it was using um, Game of Thrones, another case was using Star Wars as a means to teach the lessons of strategy and technology and the like. And so it's that, that you know, it's what I was getting, what she brought up that I think is so neat is the idea of it's the, it's the realism within the fantastic and that, that drives it home. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to your, to your broader question, um, you know, I, I guess what, what I sort of fell backwards into this realm um, of combining the fiction and the nonfiction. Um, you know, I'd written a series of nonfiction books and, and my partner on it, um, August Cole, you know, he, he was Wall Street Journal reporter. And when we started the Ghost Fleet project, it was, we wanted to give people the same kind of fun reading experience that we had had as kids. We didn't know each other as kids, but we'd both grown up, you know, reading both science fiction and techno thrillers. And, you know, for me, I'm going to date myself, but like, I remember reading Tom Clancy in the back of my mom's station wagon <laughs> on the way to Myrtle Beach. Um, you know, and, and when I say back, like literally in the back, you know, when we didn't have seatbelts and the like. And so we set out to have that kind of, you know, give people that kind of experience. That was what was inspiring us. And, we, you know, when we were creating scenes, we're like, oh, this is gonna be so much fun. But then we kept pulling on the fact that we, you know, were researchers. And so we kept populating, we were like, what would characters do? How would they act? We were fitting that in. And then that's what gave it its resonance in the real world. That's what made um, not just people enjoy it for summer, but you know, it was used in briefings and the like. And so with, in Burn-In, we sort of said, okay, let's, let's bake that in from the start. Uh, what's a topic that's treated all the time in science fiction, AI, that kind of, but, but science, it's now coming true, mm -hmm. but guess what? Science fiction got it wrong. It's, it, it's not killer robots around us. It's not singular <laughs> how or whatever. It's an industrial revolution. So you get these sort of amazing, fantastical things that would seem like magic, and yet they're playing out in our real world. Mm. Yeah. Um, we've been, the word dystopian has come up several times uh, today, even in the few minutes that we've been talking. Um, so I'm curious how central the idea of dystopia is to your creative process. Um, Maybe I'm wrong, Veronica, but I imagine that when you are in your imagining and outlining stage, um, you're thinking kind of psychologically more than technologically, perhaps. But I'm curious uh, when your big bad comes into things. Um, you know, when when does the dystopic element arise? Is it is it at the beginning? Is it as you start writing? Where do you find yourself um, with the with the antagonist of your novels? You know, I'm not, uh, it's something I've been working on uh, throughout my career is the antagonist um, because they often don't enter the story for a while for me. And then uh, throughout the, over the course of the rough draft, I feel like I get to know them or understand what, if, if it's not a person, then, you know, what kind of like force we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have to go back and like introduce it to the beginning <laughs> in this just like constant revision kind of way. Um, so for me, I think, uh, usually the antagonist is just like essentially like connected to whatever the issue in the world um, or the darker like underlying things in the world are, which I think is what gives the books, my books in general, a kind of dystopic feeling, even if they're not um, classically dystopian, because it's like what's wrong with the world is what's wrong with people, um, which is like what's wrong in the plot. Mm -hmm. So those things are kind of linked together. Interesting. Uh, Peter, how is, how is that for you? Um, do you begin with the te technological threat that makes your world dystopic? It's the, I was having this conversation with someone um, actually online and, you know, when we think, like, when we say something's dystopian and, and, and how is that defined? Is it because of 
the setting, the, the world that it is in, you know, um, it's, it's post-apocalyptic if we think about Divergent or um, it's some kind of, you know, uh, 1984, a, a techno, you know, dystopic realm. Mm -hmm. Or is it because of something about the opposition in the story? The, 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 is it the bad guy or is it because the characters are battling against a system as opposed to the setting? And, you know, I don't even know kind of where I come down on it, but it's one of the things that when I was thinking about where you were asking that, you know, what makes something dystopian? Um, one of the other uh, issues that, that I wrestle with is um, how uh, there's a very fine line between dystopian and utopian views of the world, mm -hmm. including some of the things that we see coming out of like Silicon Valley right now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how, you know, you, you can play with that in, in story. And, and it's often like an underlying theme. And one of the things that's great about, you know, taking the nonfiction, but, but putting it in the fiction is that you get to examine something from multiple different character perspectives. So uh, whether it's how a technology might seem dystopian from one point of view can be a useful tool to another. And mm -hmm. it's something I think we all kind of feel right now. Um, you know, I think about like uh, some of the face recognition technology, you know, is being used by policing. It's being used by corporations. Um, everyone from, uh, you know, Facebook to Kentucky Fried Chicken are rolling out face recognition. Oh, by the way, the police. Oh, by the way, it raises some really deep, scary issues of, you know, uh, profiling and connects to racism, you name it. So um, that, that issue of like a, a rollout of something and exploring it from different points of view, different people in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part that I particularly wrestle with and something we, we tried a, a little bit more, and I think we sort of developed further that Veronica referenced is your your, your adversary, your, your bad guy, um, trying to flesh them out so that they're not the sneering, you know, mustache pulling character, but that the, the bad actually thinks, you know, everyone is the hero in their own story. Um, and can you play that out? And, you know, so in um, burn in it's a two-handed story of there's a there's a story of a partnership between this FBI agent and this robot that she's been assigned to test out but we also follow a bad guy a new kind of terrorist but the ideology that the terrorist has is meant to be pretty empathetic um, mm -hmm. that kind of a lot of us might agree just with what he thinks if not the activities that he's doing and that's something um, I think about the applicability of that to the real world uh, everyone, even the worst villains out there, think they're the good guy. Yeah, indeed. Um, I want to get to a, a question from uh, a, a viewer. Uh, this one's for Veronica. It's from Alex Torres. Which of your stories was the hardest in terms of world building? Which was the biggest challenge as you, was, as you were writing? Oh, man, uh, that was 100% Chosen Ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because in Chosen Ones, I don't want to like spoil, but there's like a big turn in, after the first hundred pages of the book that I have to kind of lightly spoil. Um, <laughs> there is an alternate universe in Chosen Ones with an alternate history. And, um, you know, I just have like a very, an average and casual level of historical knowledge about the history of modern computing or about the Cold War or you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and for Chosen Ones, because I had decided on a point of, divergence between the universes in 1969 or 1970, I had to research everything. I mean, not everything, obviously, like, <laughs> limits, but um, a lot of the highlights of kind of, you know, where we had been, where we are in our universe, historically, um, so that I can come up with, like, a deviation that makes sense. Um, because, like, the proliferation of magic uh, changes the course of history, basically. So, um, it was definitely the hardest and the most fun to write. Um, I read hundreds of government documents from <laughs> K Ultra, which is um, our government's experiments using LSD in like the 60s and 70s, um, which are real creepy and unsettling, gotta, gotta say. Um, um, but yeah, it, was, it was definitely the most rigorous world building wise, all of the extra documents that are um, throughout like interspersed through the narrative sections of the text, each of them required like a full day of research. So um, it just, you know, it was 
a great exercise though. <laughs> you also wrote kind of in different styles. You wrote as if you were writing uh, government documents. You wrote as if you were writing a sort of sleazy journalistic profile. Um, how, how much complication did that add? Because I don't, I mean, I realize you're writing fiction. You're maybe never actually writing as Veronica would write to a friend. Um, but, you know, adding those extra levels of I am writing in this voice must have made things really quite complicated. Yeah, I was kind of not sure that I could do it at first, because um, that's a lot of different voices to take on. But it was, in the, um, at the end of the day, a really amazing creative exercise. Um, some of them made me want to take a shower afterward, <laughs> like the misogynistic uh, piece of journalism that you're referring to. Um, but the, the funny, one of the funny things that happened was that in copy edits, it's kind of your copy editor's job to eliminate like passive voice and like, you know, sort of uh, useless like clauses and sentences and stuff. And so in the government documents, a copy <laughs> editor would correct a lot of the like government lingo. And I was like, no, no. This is essential because no one ever wants to take responsibility for anything. So it's all passive voice all the time. Um, and so that was just one of the, just one example of a lot of the kind of voice considerations that had to be made. Um, but man, it was, I, I don't know, just, uh, I think the more challenging something is, the more fun it is for a writer. And so, um, yeah, Peter's nodding, you know. <laughs> exactly. Especially once you finished it. I do see you nodding, Peter. Uh, so I'm wondering, like, as somebody who's... Violent agreement. <laughs> <laughs> as somebody who, I believe, started as a nonfiction writer, like, do you find yourself, um, you know, okay, I, I've, got to, I've got to put on a fictional voice. I've got to write in the, in the language of, of thrillers. Um, how do you get into that headspace? Oh, yeah. Um, and it's part of, actually, referencing what Ron said, it's part of the fun of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so nonfiction is an assembling of facts and it's um you know you're basically get, i sort of i've got kids so i think of like it's almost like a parallel of um a puzzle or or legos you're mm -hmm. sort of getting all of them together and then you're ordering them you're assembling them and then you build with it um whereas uh fiction you are doing that. You're getting certain elements um, and you're doing just like Veronica Reverend, you're, you know, sometimes there's research and the like, but you also are just struck by inspiration at um, various moments. And it might be a direct kind of inspiration. Um, it, someone in the real world says something and you're like, ooh, that's a, and it might be a micro level, that's an awesome turn of phrase or they're, they're wearing something or, or whatever, a tiny detail, um, or it might be something macro. Ooh, I'm, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the plot. Um, it hits in all sorts of different places. Um, you know, it hits uh, in, at work, it hits in, in, in the shower. Um, and you and you know it when it happens because um, you get that kind of excitement of uh, that's the crack that's the breakthrough. Um, you also uh, there's a working at it where there might be a problem that you're kind of puzzling your way out. You know, it's the character um, not actually, but like locked in a room. Mm -hmm. How do I get my character out of this situation in a manner that's um, faithful to? the rules that we've set, either how the character operates or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and here again, there's that kind of joy that you get when, you, when they get out of the <laughs> locked room, so to speak. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, I think that's one of the fundamental differences of it. Um, but one, uh, you know, it's interesting you were referencing, and I'd be interested in hearing this from you, Veronica, the, the editing process, um, to me, uh, there is a, there's a, similarity of you've got the standard, you know, editors and, and, and copy editors and the like, but I, we, I share both fiction and nonfiction with trusted resources. Um, on the nonfiction side, it's usually people who are experts in that and they're kind of checking for the expertise. On mm -hmm. the fiction side, it's people checking both for, um, do they enjoy it, the pacing of it, but also um, uh, did that sound right right so you might pick someone um we have a female lead character so i made you know there's a, a, a various women of that background that i wanted them to read to ensure that we're hitting 
you know, everything from how she spoke to how she wore her hair. <laughs> did we, was that faithful to the character? And, and I'd be interested, like, do you do the same of, do you share your drafts with people who are giving you not just kind of the classic fiction, but like the voice feedback? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think I had someone read for authenticity and chosen one specifically about racism um, and like a, a black person in America's encounter with racism. Um, it's not my main character who is dealing with that, but one of the prominent side characters. And I was like, I can do a lot of research about this and I did, but I just need to make sure that it sounds right um, to someone, you know, preferably more than one person. Um, but yeah, I definitely with every book have shared the draft with people who have, with various different layers of experience of particular things, which I don't know if that's a thing that's self-evident to people outside of writing, because if you're writing science fiction and fantasy, there's sort of this idea that you should just like be able to make it all up, but that's not, <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, so being able to access something that feels accurate and authentic and responsible, um, I don't know, you need, you need more eyes basically. Yeah. Um, uh, Peter, what I want to know is, uh, I've been wondering this the whole time, did you have to stretch like the truth or what's possible for the book in certain ways? And does that make you mad <laughs> when you have to do that? Does it make you uncomfortable as someone who's like came from nonfiction? Um, what we'll do is, uh, the bad guy actually is maybe not 10 feet tall, but is like eight feet tall. And by, by that, I mean um, the you know, in one story, it's a story of uh, what World War III might look like. And the, the bad guy in it, it's a US, China, Russia war. Um, and they are able to go after every real world vulnerability. So they're kind of extra smart, so to speak. And it's the same thing our, you know, dastardly terrorist in Burn-In, you know, he's, he's hitting every, you know, all plot spoil. He basically creates uh, uh, digital versions of the 10 biblical plagues hitting DC. Um, and he's, so he's, he's a little more capable than, than, but it's that, so I think it's, you know, what I'm getting at is, um, I think it's okay that they're that way because um, one, it makes a better story. Two, if we go to the real world side, if you're helping with the you know, explanation or um, prevention, you know, you're, you're telling about this is the worst day possible. Mm -hmm. The flaw in a lot of the real world policy stuff is that people plan for the best day possible, not okay, the bad guy might do X, Y, or Z. Um, so I guess that's the, uh, the part that, um, you know, uh, I won't say it's frustrating, but I'm sort of conscious that we're doing that, that the bad guy is slightly more capable. And then what you do is consciously build in, you know, there's certain things that he fails at, or there's a moment when he's trying to escape and he, you know, slips in mud and stumbles and, you know, and there's these sort of, he can't find his way out and he, and he sort of, um, you, you are conscious of that, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. um, it's one other thing I would say that, that's interesting when you raised about sharing um, drafts with people. One of the things that stuck in the back of my head on the reason for this is not just the sort of the overall realism, but how if you get one tiny th real world thing wrong, um, it'll stick for people. I just always think like yeah. my, we'll reference TV shows, but like my father was um, a military lawyer and there are things in like the TV show Jag that they would wear their uniform slightly wrong and that would make him hate the show, mm -hmm. not that they were like involved in a court martial of where, you know, a conspiracy theory that led all the way to the president, blah, blah, blah. That if you get that one turn of phrase wrong, you know, oh, a teenager wouldn't say that or oh, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's the part that people's um, suspension of disbelief, mm -hmm. they'll accept the big fantastic plot stuff. They won't if you get, you know, actually no, that street is two blocks over or something like that. Mm -hmm. or, uh, I remember seeing people um, years ago riding the subway in DC on the, in a movie, but it was clearly the Baltimore subway, which I understood why, but it, it was the same thing. That's all I remember about that movie. I don't remember anything else. Those, the one error sticks with you more than the thousand yeah. accuracies. That's, that's just human, human life. 
Um, another question from a viewer. Um, the question is from Kim Kelly. And she wants to know, do you purposely try to incorporate current day issues in your work? Or, you or do you find that it subconsciously makes its way in? And I guess I'll add another question. And do you um, welcome it or do you try to push, uh, you know, push away current day issues? Well, um, for me, it's a, it's subconscious. It's never, I, uh, the approach of, of that would be hard for me. Like I'm going to make a point about X or Y <laughs> is not really what makes me interested in telling stories. Um, especially because I rarely know what I think that confidently about anything. <laughs> so, um, it's only by writing that I end up, uh, figuring out that I'm exploring something that's on my mind. Um, but that's what happens because, you know, I'm a real person living in the real world and I become concerned about the things around me. And I read uh, a lot about, you know, science and technology and the news and all that stuff. And so it's sort of like living in my head and then it will kind of like creep its way in. It doesn't bother me when that happens. Um, I do try to be conscious of kind of, I mean, your work is always saying something, whether you intend it to or not. Um, it reflects your unconscious biases and, and all that. So um, it's kind of like once the draft is done, you can look at like, well, what am I saying? Um, what is this, it, does this story say to people? So that's something I think is uh, useful to be aware of, but um, that's like a later in the process thing for me. I suspect that the answer will be different for you, Peter. <laughs> uh, it is different, but I would say, you know, one of the things that I'm conscious of is not just, you know, how we're shaped by our surroundings and issues that are going on, but, um, and this is again, kind of a, 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 you know, pulling back the veil for, for people. Books are really long processes. <laughs> Um, in terms of building. So there's the, the writing of it that takes, you know, multiple years, but then there's the, okay, I've turned my draft in and then you've got, you know, depending on the timeline, roughly another year plus before it comes out. Mm -hmm. um, then you have, okay, I would like the book not just to do well and be useful and interesting to people the first week that it comes out, but in an ideal world, it's something that, you know, lasts for years so you have to be conscious of that. You know, there may be something that's really, really hot right now or that, um, and again, whether it's a issue in politics to a technology that, you know, you have to say, okay, is it going to be out there three, four, 20 years from now? Um, and so that's always in, in my mind. Um, what I would share, one of the, you asked about like, how does it feel June um, or the, the questioners, um, one of the things that's been striking and strange, and I'm, I'm at a loss for the right uh, verbiage, uh, amusingly enough to describe it, is um, we knew with Burnin that the technology parts of it would come true because of the research side. You know, it's it literally, it's a novel that has research endnotes in it. So when a certain robot was, deployed in the real world well we knew that because the amazon you know we had the the, the patent for it mm -hmm. or when right now there's literally a cyber attack playing out in israel that's something that we talked about in the book it, it's hitting water treatment plants well we knew because this is vulnerabilities we knew that would happen the part that was strange was and it goes to what you asked earlier Jen, the dystopian elements that we built as a conscious like to create a dystopian future washington dc those happened um so eight days after the book came out uh one scene in the book there is a militarized perimeter fence thrown up around the white house with an mrap in front mm. of it which is a military vehicle it's literally at the perimeter line that we had it in the book there was another scene that we thought was our kind of ultimate dystopian of riot police around the base of the lincoln memorial uh and that happened, you know, again, and we were like, okay, that's the part that, that, you know, I wasn't prepared for. And it was the part that I thought was going to be kind of the imaginary dystopian that instead, you know, we're feeling these themes in the real world. And I think that's part of the, you know, the, the utility of dystopian fiction um, or things that are said in dystopian is that, you know, they, they imagine these worlds and um, they warn us of, uh, yeah you know, the, the perils of if it comes true. Uh, Veronica, I'm very curious. Um, 
as, as we said earlier, Chosen Ones is your first book written explicitly for adults, but um, you know, your, your earlier novels were all intended for young adults. Um, and the dystopian worlds, uh, your books, uh, The Hunger Games, maybe even the Harry Potter books, they're very successful, very popular dystopian set worlds. Why do you think that young readers are so drawn to dystopian stories? Uh, I've thought about this a lot, as you're probably not surprised to hear. Um, and I mean, really, I, I'm not sure. Um, but if I could hazard a guess, it's that if you remember high school at all, that is, <laughs> I mean, it really is. So you kind of, I mean, if, whether it's dramatic or not, like some people's lives really are really difficult as adolescents. And some people just feel that their lives are very difficult. Um, but either way, that's your emotional reality. It's yeah. um, um, it's a very difficult time, I think, to be a person and to be taking shape. Um, and so when you're reading about a character who's handling something so much worse than what is around you, I think there's some um, something empowering about that, but also some like catharsis, kind of like seeing your emotional reality reflected in stories is important, especially at that age. So that's my working theory. <laughs> I buy it. Um, I throw a, 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 an addendum on that? Please. Um, uh, and it comes out of actually research for a nonfiction book um, I did, which was on robots. I went around interviewing uh, both robot designers and like, but also science fiction authors uh, about where they got their ideas from and the like, and why they thought it resonated and struck the real world. And, and one of them uh, I remember was a conversation with um, Orson Scott Card who did Ender's Game and you know, sort of asking why he thought it connected so much. Um, and we then saw it play out in um, sort of connecting to different resonance, whether it's, you know, Handmaid's Tale or, or, or whatnot, is that dystopian um, fiction, um, it's, well, whatever the setting, like how we would define it, it's actually a story of, there's an agency involved. It's a, it's a story of um, perseverance, usually. You know, we follow a set of heroes as mm -hmm. they finally, they usually kind of control the destiny of this world. And so I, the addendum on top of like high school being awful, uh, it's also that there is a uh, kind of in, in youth, I think there's a sense of like not controlling everything that goes on around you. And yet most of these stories is about someone sort of ultimately deciding to take control in some way, shape or form and reshaping their world and their decisions in it. Yeah, I used to get, um, you know, I still do actually, uh, a lot of concerned parents <laughs> talking to me about how their kid is really into dystopian fiction and don't I think that's dark and should they be worried? And um, I always told them, no, absolutely not, because your kid is reading a story about becoming more aware of the world around you and seeing the problems that exist and then fighting to fix them. So these are, this is a very positive sign for your child. Yeah. Uh, on a somewhat related uh, topic, we have a, another question from a viewer, from Anthony, um, who's, who asks, do either of you worry about the real world taking inspiration from the negative aspects of the worlds you've created in your stories? Um, Peter, in, perhaps it's, that's a little easier to, to answer. You might actually be giving bad guys ideas. I'm wondering how you think about that. But Veronica, I know it's maybe less direct for you, but um, do you worry about like, how do you feel about people comparing real world people to the antagonists in your stories? Like, I know it's slightly different, but I'm curious about how you both deal with that interaction between your ideas and the real world. We'll start with you, Peter, maybe. Um, I'm smiling because I'm, I'm thinking about the, the and, you know, and we don't have this now in the land of uh, coronavirus era, but um, the type, you know, the, the, the people that come to your events and you, you know, know the different backgrounds and the like. And I'm smiling because um, uh, many years back, um, I, I had two different groups that hit, hit your question, this question exactly, uh, two different people that showed up. One was, um, <laughs> it was basically a, a Chinese uh, spy with incredibly horrible tradecraft. Um, who was, it was like out of a, a James Bond satire of someone uh, and just, it was like, stop acting like you're a fan. I know who you are. Let's <laughs> like, stop. Um, and, uh, and oh, by the way, you don't need to do this 
just there's the book. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> other was actually, uh, and this, these are both from Burning because it was about a U.S.-China war. The other was actually a Chinese military officer who was open about the fact that they were a Chinese military officer. And he talked about how um, popular the book was uh, among his fellow officers. And I smiled and said, that's funny because um, you didn't buy, there's no Chinese language rights to it. And then he smiled <laughs> back and it was a, you know, intellectual property theft issue. Right. Um, but but I, my take on it is look, um, in the real world, I'm, I'm not aiding the bad guys because the bad guys have already gone after these issues. They're already engaged in the same kind of research at a scale that I'm not able to offer. Actually by exploring them and surfacing these problems that are known problems, I'm painting them in ways that act as um, ideally not um, prediction but or inspiration, but prevention. I've pointed out the bad day that will happen if you don't fix X, Y, or Z. And then what we've seen is in some cases, the book won't come true because things have happened to fix X, Y, or Z. So that, that's my take on it. Got it. Yeah, I, I think... Really, you don't have the same fan experiences of spy showing up. <laughs> no, <laughs> one day. Um, no, I haven't had that experience. But I think if you're a writer, you feel, in general, we feel like uh, knowing things is better than not knowing them. Um, and so, when you're shedding a light on something, that's that's a good thing. Um, so I don't. I mean, I don't think <laughs> I don't think my books really lend themselves <laughs> to uh, inspiring bad guys. <laughs> But because uh, that would require, you know, magic or some kind of technology that cannot exist. Um, so yet, <laughs> there yeah. seems in divergent though that I could see someone running with. Um, oh yeah, I guess like uh, jumping off buildings or trains or something. Um, I really hope that no one was inspired by divergent. Um, but gosh, who knows? I don't really, I don't really worry about it because. Uh, People are going to do what they're going to do usually. Um, we don't really like plant things in people's minds. Yeah, yeah, we're not that powerful. Um, uh, Peter, I have a question here from Cameron Bukhari. And uh, he says, or they say, I'm not sure if either of the authors have followed the show's 24 and more recently designated survivor. Uh, both, show, both shows set in Washington, D.C., of course. Both depict developments that some years afterward came to pass. To what extent are story writers extrapolating from the present to imagine the future? And to what degree is it an illustration of the aspirational? Some of them, some of which then over time come true. Uh, so extrapolating from the present to imagine the future or an illustration of the aspirational? What do you think? I would say it's the extrapolating side um, because uh, Fictional creators um, ask in some way, shape, or form, what if? Um, and, and actually, again, I, I remember speaking to it. Um, it was a woman who was, she used to be a NASA scientist, and then she was the um, uh, creator of the, um, the, she was the first curator of the Science Fiction Museum and Hall of Fame. And she talked about how um, science fiction doesn't tell you how to build the atomic bomb it tells you, you know, what if you built it, uh, you know, what if Dr. Strangelove might happen or on the beach or whatever. Um, and so we're not bound by, you know, budget, uh, a government budget, but we'll say, okay, what if you built X or what if magic did Y or what if this circumstance hit the United States? And so that does allow a certain kind of extrapolation if those what ifs are linked to something in the real world? What if a terrorist was trying to do X or what if they accomplished Y? Um, I think that's the, uh, our playing with the what ifs um, allows that to play out is uh, I guess the shorthand way I would, would answer it. And that again goes back to the, the utility of it. Um, the other thing to remember is um, because we're throwing so many different ideas out there uh, when the part that comes true, we get the credit for that. You don't get, you know, the, the reference to 24, like, you know, 24 had how many different seasons and you know, how many different episodes per season. And so, you know, there's lots of stuff that they didn't get right, but they get the 
the correct people remember the correct part of it. Right. Um, there's a long, long history of that on whether it's imagining. Um, there's a there's a series of books that were in, written in the 1920s that um, imagined World War II uh, that you know got Pearl Harbor right, but then there's other elements of it that they. Uh, it's a, it's a, Bywater is the author, um, and people like you look back and like, how did he predict that? But then there's other elements of it where it had chemical warfare in it that yeah. had happened in World War One and made sense that he would think it would happen in World War Two, and then it didn't. No one remembers that part, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think we're because we throw so many ideas out there, we also get credit for things sometimes that um, we don't remember the losses. Yeah, and as somebody who watched Twenty Four all the way through, I'm very glad that many of those things have at least not yet come true. Um, uh, another one from a uh, viewer, um, from Sienna Negron. Uh, I'd like to ask this of you, Veronica. When developing characters in fiction, how do you make them relatable if they have supernatural attributes or surroundings? So when these people who are, you know, just have gifts that, that I don't have, how do you uh, make them somebody who, who readers can relate to? Oh, well, hmm. <laughs> Well, I think uh, this was kind of the central question of Chosen Ones for me. So mm. I grew up reading uh, Chosen Ones stories. Anyone who likes science fiction and fantasy did also, you know, Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or Dune, you know, like they're all Chosen Ones stories. So, um, but my curiosity came from not really understanding what the psychology of those people would be like after they were finished with their whole like quest um, because I imagine it would like that quest is essentially like a depiction of a trauma um, <laughs> for all of them, really. And um, so I, I think I just try to take the supernatural part of it seriously. And there's always kind of a real world correlation that you can look to to make sure that um, you're being, I don't know, uh, honest, even if you're not, you know, it's not factual. Mm -hmm. So. For Sloane, the main character of Chosen Ones, I just did a lot of research on PTSD um, because that's what she has um, as a result of kind of this like a protracted battle with the Dark Lord prior to the start of the novel. Um, so I looked at, you know, how that would manifest in just the average person who endured something um, really incredibly difficult now and tried to bring that psychology to her. So the fact that it's supernatural is really not um, is not relevant to the character. Um, and I haven't, I haven't had a character with like, uh, yeah, I have, <laughs> sorry, I was about to say something totally accurate. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that's, um, and I, I always want like, even in the, the Card of the Mark books, they, they have like special powers or abilities, but they come from the psychology of the character. So it's not the other way around, like figuring out how the power influences the psychology. It's always, kind of a character out. Um, and I think that helps a lot when you're, when you're building a person who feels real, even if their circumstances are unreal. Peter, for your main character um, or main characters, um, is there a challenge of not wanting them to be super competent to kind of keep within the realm of believability? How do you kind of balance that? So it's two different ways, um, uh, in particular on Burnin. One is, uh, the main character, uh, Lara Keegan, is, um, you know, to put it bluntly, a rarity in the space of, of techno thrillers. It's a, it's a female lead character. Um, in most of them, if there is a female uh, lead, they're the 1B, they're the helper to the <laughs> male lead. You know, the girl with the dragon tattoo, we could go on and on. Mm -hmm. um, but then even more so, uh, she's, you know, a, again, I, I would say developed or realistic, you know, she's a, an FBI agent, but she's also in a marriage that's crumbling and she's the mom of a five-year-old. Uh, and uh, that, that balancing act and, and the diff how different um, parts of your psyche and your identity come through in different moments. You know, I would just, it, it's trying to be fu a fully realized character, but also I would argue realistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the other one that's, um, it's actually the inverse of the psychology side, uh, the other character is a technology. It's not a character, but it mm -hmm. is a character. Tams is basically your Alexa um, uh, or Siri move 10 years forward. 
um, and or the robots that we've seen, like the YouTube clips of Boston Dynamics doing, you know, flips or the like. It's just mm -hmm. take that move forward. And everything that it says and does is what a AI will say and do or already does. It's a technology, but the, the twist for, is both Keegan knows it's a technology, but can't help herself and is every so often reacting to it as if it's a person. Um, and we, the reader, we're reading into things that it says and does as if they are a joke or as if it is, uh, it, there's a moment where something happens to it. And, you know, hopefully if, if, it, if the scene works out as a reader, you're reacting differently than you would if the car was turned off, right? And, but the, here again, this is drawn from the real world. Um, one of the early inspirations for the book was um, uh, teams in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, in one case, um, they, they're using real world robotic systems and they ran one of them, the robot got stuck in the mud and they ran, the human ran out under heavy machine gun fire to rescue the robot. And this was a remote controlled, no speaking, looks mm -hmm. like a little lawnmower, and yet the human risked their life to save their teammate. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was struck by that, and that's back in 2003. What happens is they begin to walk, talk, or mm -hmm. you know, the coronavirus example of this is, I was having a bad day a couple of weeks back, and um, Alexa wasn't working correctly, and I yelled at Alexa. Um, and I wouldn't yell at it, it wouldn't, it was doing timer for while I was cooking, and, and, and Alexa turned yeah, off yeah. timer, I wouldn't, and I yelled at it. I would never yell at my stove, but I, and <laughs> so it, that's what that the, the, the blending of the psychology with yeah. the technology is something that um, I find challenging, but it's also sort of the essence of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just thinking of that. There's a moment in on the show Community where Jeff Winger's doing a rant as he does, and he says something about how you, I can show you this pencil and tell you its name is Steve, and then break it, and you care. Um, and um, we are so quick to personify things for sure. Yeah. We can't help ourselves, and and yeah. and this will move forward in the real world. And again, is it utopian or dystopian um, when you're uh, you have to explain to your kid that their teddy bear that is able to talk and walk is not actually alive or not or when it i mean think you know and again this like sci-fi and yet real world issues looming mm -hmm. well speaking of the real world we have another really great question from dominic good uh, um will this experience of pandemic and lockdowns result in some new dystopian stories uh, I'm, I guess I'll put it another way. How do you both kind of foresee the pandemic appearing uh, in fiction? Um, do you think it'll appear in your own fiction? Uh, will you be trying to keep it out? Maybe we'll start with you, Veronica. Uh, for me, I think it's going to take a couple of years to know the answer to that question. So I can never write about something when I'm inside it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard to reflect in any meaningful way on something that you're dealing with in real time, I think. Um, so we'll see, <laughs> but, um, I think this feeling of kind of collective effort that we had at the beginning of the pandemic is what feels like it's going to stick with me. Um, obviously it was not fully collective, you know, not everyone was on board, but a lot of people like in my immediate social circle, it was like, we're doing this together, you know? Um, and then kind of trying to innovate in the midst of that difficulty. Um, and, you know, that's why I have a great virtual event set up right now, because <laughs> for the first few months, it was like, all right, we're doing this. Um, yeah. So I think that that has, is what's resonated with me from the beginning of the pandemic. But of course, there's so much, there's so much um, other stuff to think about the isolation of it, and then the way it's become politicized. And um, just all that stuff is gonna, I think, linger for a long time. We have yet to see what effects it will have. Um, so I hope people write about it because I think this is like a sort of, this is a big struggle that everyone had together, um, no matter how they feel about it. So we're gonna need to process that emotionally and um, you know, in practically in the world around us. So. Yeah, Peter, what do you think? Oh, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, 
trying to wear a dual hat of like creator, but also, you know, futurist predictor. Um, mm -hmm. I, my gut is telling me, I mean, not just for myself, but I think for the field that um, you're going to see a reduction, a massive reduction of uh, the pandemic sub genre of all of this. I think it just, um, you know, connects too close to home to, you know, what, what is it? How do you build upon it? Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's, we can think of just, there's literally scores of pandemic themed, either it's set in a pandemic or uh, you're stopping a pandemic or it's after a pandemic. I, I think that genre will shrink in the next mm -hmm. decade plus, um, I think is a, a reaction to this. I think the themes, the issues that have been surfaced um, those will color everything, just like how, you know, you think of how, whether it's um, the, the literature that was written before versus after the Great Depression is just fundamentally different. The, the way the 1960s in Vietnam and civil rights changes, you know, um, literature, science fiction, you name it. I feel like we're at that same kind of moment. Um, and uh, maybe a larger question or kind of issue coming out of this, it's funny, I was earlier today, part of a, um, they all feel the same. It was a Zoom call, but with a very different group and audience. It was a group of defense leaders. And one of the things that I talked about on that and, you know, connects to the burning book or the like is um, what the pandemic did and is doing, but also what, you know, all the issues that have come out of um, the killing of George Floyd and the protests and unrest is that we had issues that were there and were in play beforehand but they, it took them, it surfaced them, it put a, it put a point on them, it um, drove it home. And one of the themes running through all of this is that um, whether we're talking about the healthcare system or the social contract in America or you know, whatever, is that America is not a weak state, but there's a brittleness to us. There's a brittleness to our healthcare system. There's a brittleness when you think about the, it, 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 and under certain pressures, it cracks. It, it looked like it was strong, but it cracks. And I think that theme of kind of the, and even, you know, in our, our personal lives, but I think that that brittleness is going to be something that um, sticks with us and is, a, is like a hangover on top of you know the writing that comes out of this, whether it's something related to race and racism, or, or it's a setting, you know, discussion of um, family impact or whatever it is, I think that sort of how under pressure the cracking that happens, things that seem strong are actually kind of weak. Um, I think that's a theme that'll be with us for the long term because it's it's something that that we're all coming to grips with as a nation. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think the emotional impact of it and the um, I don't know how many people will just go out and write a pandemic story. I feel like that's the last thing I want to do. Um, <laughs> even if I was interested before, now I'm like, definitely not. <laughs> um, so, but I think there's a lot of this, um, a lot of things have become clear to us, right? That they've been thrown into relief by, mm. by, by what's happened, um, like you said. So that, those, those, um, that kind of like an emotional stuff will hang around and um, the way that we've become kind of like deeply uneasy in our systems that we might have trusted before, um, that that sort of thing will carry over. However, I do think there will be a small but vital subgenre of like actual pandemic fiction. And the reason I say that is because right after it, like everyone went into quarantine, like a lot of my friends started watching <laughs> Contagion. <laughs> I was like, no, that's the last thing I want to watch. But there are some people for whom their strategy for coping is to look directly into the eyes of the problem, like yeah. literally. Um, and I think that helps them to kind of restore a feeling of control. Um, like, oh, well, they handled it in this movie, so <laughs> I guess we can handle it in our lives, um, which of course is, you know, dubiously accurate. But um, <laughs> I do think there are people who cope that way. Um, Did you, can, I, can I say one, yeah. one quick please, thing? Please, that please, just please. I also think it's going to be interesting um, how it plays out different generationally. So, you know, like Veronica, uh -huh. you mentioned, you know, like Tolkien. Tolkien is, is, is massive, that whole fantasy, they're massively influenced because they were youth during World War I, right? And I, I think they'll be in the same of like the writing coming out of the 1960s and the like. It's going to be interesting. I think, um, you know, people who are 
adults, parents during mm -hmm. this are going to be inspired and write in different ways than someone who is a teenager right now and how the effect of this is going to play out on their writing, you know, 10 years from now. Um, that's going to be really fascinating in much the same way, you know, people see World War I elements in Tolkien and maybe it wasn't conscious or not, we can have a debate about that. I think mm -hmm. kind of future literary critics are going to like, anyone who lived during this period, they're going to like point to it as like, oh, that's the effect of the pandemic on their writing. Um, we are at time, but I just want to ask one last question to each of you. Um, you both have newly published books, are published books in the, in the recent past. Um, but as you mentioned earlier, Peter, it takes a while for a book to uh, be published from when you finish writing it. So I imagine you are both deep into the writing of your next books. If there's anything you can share about what, what you are working on in, in as broad or as, or as precise terms as you'd like, I'm sure everybody would be interesting. Maybe we'll begin with you, Veronica. Oh boy. <laughs> Don't start with me. I have nothing to say. <laughs> yeah, will, I, it, will it be dystopian, I guess, is a, is a big question. I'm just playing with ideas right now. Um, so I have committed to nothing, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I did find it really difficult to work um, at the start of the pandemic, partly because my book came out uh, in the first week of April. So yeah. <laughs> it's just like the worst, yes. the worst coin of it um, in some ways. But uh, so I'm still kind of like reeling from that a little. But, um, but yeah, just uh, now I can work again and write again. So it's time to explore. Peter, have you got something on the boil? It's, it's sort of the same, uh, you know, uh, feel of a, uh, our book came out in May and the same, just this, it, you know, I've had multiple books come out. This was fundamentally different in a lot of different ways and mm. more exhausting, um, strangely, without all the travel. Mm. Uh, I mean, um, and I'm still somewhat in the midst of helping to support it. Um, the, I'll put it this way, we're, we're we proved with, Ghost Fleet and then Burn In that the combination of fiction and nonfiction work together and that there's a there's a, both an audience for it, but also a utility of it. And so what we're now doing is exploring that as a toolkit that might be used not just as books, but as short stories and also in different forms, but for not just our own creativity, but for different organizations. Um, so like, as an example, something that we, I can talk about backwards, you know, we don't want to share too much, but like, <laughs> um, we did a project for the U S Congress actually, that was, they had a report on cybersecurity. We created out of their report, a short story that's a, that they actually used as the introduction to their huh. report. So we're kind of playing with the idea of, um, using the useful fiction tool for other topics and other forms is another one that's a graphic novella that we help the army with. Um, and here again, the, the idea is that, um, can you use that approach and apply it for other people's problems or interests? Mm -hmm. um, that's the most that I can share right now. Interesting. Well, I thank you both for sharing uh, as you have. Thank you so much to this amazing audience that sent so many great questions. Um, thank you very much to Veronica Roth, whose most recent book is Chosen Ones, to B.W. Peter Singer, whose most recent book is Burn In. Um, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you on another of these events. Thank you, everyone.